poem entitled, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, composed by Charles Converse and arranged by Mark Cade. <laughs> Welcome everyone, friends and neighbors, to the North Kent Presbyterian Church online worship experience. Because COVID-19 virus is still at a dangerous level in Kent County, we are only gathering online. While our hearts yearn to be face to face again, we must not tire of protecting our friends, and we will continue to avoid physical contact. We do this because we are followers of Christ called to practice agape or self-sacrificial love. Welcome to our online worship experience. If you have not yet picked up your 2021 giving envelopes and would like to have them delivered, please let Pastor Karen know. The envelopes have been moved back inside the building. Pledge cards for the 2021 year are also available and have been mailed to you. Please return those to Mike Frampton as soon as possible. Former member Jesse Howell is now back in her own apartment. Her doctor is pleased with her progress after brain surgery. Cards of encouragement are still appreciated and her address is in your emailed announcements for today. Camp Greenwood is having another fundraising auction. Donated items are being accepted now and the auction will run from January 24 to February 14. If you are interested in participating in a congregational Valentine exchange in February, please email the church to get on the list. This activity will be done via the U.S. mail. 
Presbyterian women. The Wednesday, January 20th Women's Breakfast will include a Zoom discussion of how we want to disperse our funds. The breakfast meeting will begin at 8.30, followed by a how to disperse our funds discussion between 9 and 9.30. A summary of the meeting will be emailed to each woman of the church. The summary will give specific amounts of money to the group decided to assign to each nonprofit. Each woman is then asked to respond by January 24 to the email with a yes, I am in, and I am in agreement with these allocations, or no, I disagree and am not comfortable with these allocations. The mission committee has decided to focus on homelessness again this winter. With so many without shelter, we encourage anyone who is able to do so consider supporting either the North Kent Connect program in place to help with rent or Family Promise. If you choose to give through the church, please send your donations to Treasurer Mike Frampton, clearly marked for the program of your choice. The members of this congregation have hearts for mission, and no matter how you choose to give or which organizations you choose to support, our community is better for your generosity. Thank you. And now, let us prepare to worship the Lord. Dear God, as the world screams in crisis, we look to you. Help us to walk in your footsteps, to stand so close to you that we are always in your shadow. Help us to trust in you, Help us to say, you are my refuge and my fortress. You are my God in whom I trust. For even as the light dawns after a long night of darkness, filling the glens and the valleys with peace, your presence gives us comfort and strength. Help us to be your disciples in this time and place and to follow you and learn and grow and live in you forever. Amen. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare, should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Will you let the blinded see if I but call your name? Will you set the prisoners free and never be the same? Will you kiss the leper clean, and do such as this unseen, and admit to what I mean in you and you in me? Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me? Lord, you some in echoes true in you, but call my name. Let me turn and follow you. In your company I'll go, 
where your loving's footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. Will you join me in our prayer of confession? Dear God, we admit that we are often so caught up in the nets of our own lives that we cannot see beyond them. We are lured by our lust for power and control over ourselves and others. Our emotions, our fears, our doubts, and our petty grievances hold us back from following you with our whole being. Set us free from the lies that hook us and rip our hearts. Release us into your ocean of love that holds us and lifts us up from the depth of our pain. Heal us and unify us and make us your people of peace. Amen. Will you join me in saying these words of assurance of pardon? No matter who you are, no matter what you have done or what has been done to you, the love and grace of God is greater than all our brokenness. I assure you that through the work of Jesus Christ, we are all completely forgiven. Glory to God, whose goodness shines on me, and to the Son, whose grace has pardoned me, and to the Spirit, whose love has set me free. morning comes from 1 Samuel 3, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 10. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel! And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak. For your servant is listening. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry. second scripture for today comes from John chapter 1 verses 44 through 51. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Then he added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. While we do not know much about the disciple of Jesus named Nathanael, Scripture does give us Nathanael's call story. The story all begins with Nathanael sitting under a fig tree. We don't know what he was doing there, whether he was alone or whether he was with someone, what he was thinking. But we know that Philip knew Nathanael and that Philip went looking for him to tell him about Jesus. I can imagine what happened. Philip probably first went to Nathaniel's house, knocked on the door, and asked for him there. When Nathaniel wasn't home, Philip then started asking friends, family, and neighbors if they had seen Nathaniel or if they knew where he had gone. When Philip finally caught up with his friend under a fig tree, he lost no time in telling him about his discovery of a Messiah for the Jews. It is then that we hear the famous exchange where Nathaniel exclaims out loud something that many people had been wondering. Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Everyone had questions about this man from Nazareth. Could he be the Messiah? Some people thought it was doubtful. The Messiah was supposed to be a conquering hero, someone famous that others would naturally look up to that would become a king. 
The Messiah wasn't supposed to be a nobody carpenter from a tiny village, especially a village in an area with such a bad reputation for failed revolutionary leadership. You see, in 4 BC, when Herod the Great died, a political uprising happened near Nazareth. The Roman armory and treasury in Sepphoris, a wealthy Jewish upper-class city just four miles from Nazareth, was robbed by a Jewish rebel named Judas, who was the son of a local troublemaker named Ezekias. After Judas' gang stole both gold and weapons, Judas then armed his followers in a revolt against the Roman rulers in an attempt to overthrow the government. In response to this Jewish uprising, the Romans simply burned Sephorus to the ground, and then they methodically sold off all of its Jewish inhabitants as slaves. They used some of the funds from the sale of the Jews to rebuild the city, which then, naturally, became politically much more supportive of the Roman government. It is suggested by some scholars that perhaps Joseph and Jesus would have helped in the reconstruction of the city of Sephorus by completing some of the carpentry work after it was purposefully and vengefully destroyed. Now this theory would explain how Joseph's family financially could have survived in such a small village like Nazareth without a lot of carpentry needs in itself. And while this scenario may be likely, another more likely fact was Jesus' exposure to another terrible event that happened at Sephorus. When Jesus was just a boy, a second Jewish revolt happened there. This one was a violent protest by the Sephorus Jews about paying Roman taxes. This uprising was also unsuccessful and resulted in severe reprisals. Some scholars estimate that over 2,000 Jews were crucified by the Romans in punishment for that second uprising. We can only imagine the horrible image of all of those crucified bodies set up in public spaces on display. That would be a horror that would be never forgotten by the young Jesus when he saw it as a boy. Today, we would call such a sight a traumatic childhood event. But with these two major failed uprisings as the storied history of Sephorus and its nearby poor village of Nazareth, it is no wonder that even in Bethsaida that Nathaniel knew of the bad reputation of Jesus' boyhood home. His knowledge of the two failed uprisings by Jewish leaders that resulted in thousands of Jews sold into slavery or ending up with them crucified by Romans, this was not a good sign for the origin location of a new Jewish Messiah. It would be like saying that your new government resistance movement leader was from Waco, Texas and Ruby Ridge, Idaho. But indeed, Nazareth was Jesus' place of origin. But unlike his predecessors from the area who broke into buildings to steal Roman gold and weapons, or who led an uprising of Jews against the government about their payment of taxes to Rome, Jesus was a different kind of Messiah. His campaign was not one of a violent uprising against the Roman authorities. He did not arm his disciples with weapons. He did not come up with plans on how to best cripple a Roman soldier or how to stealthily gain access to the buildings of the Roman government. Instead, Jesus campaigned for the hearts and the minds of his followers in a movement to love and care for your neighbor. While the Roman government was afraid of Jesus and his popularity with the crowds, and while the Romans crucified him, for their suspicions that he was guilty of sedition, it is important to remember that Jesus never led an army. He had never attempted a coup to overthrow the Romans and to put the Jewish people back in charge of their promised land. 
It was the hearts and the minds of people that Jesus set out to change. He was not interested in forced compliance or setting up a new Hebrew government. Now, tomorrow, here in the United States, we will celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Known for his leadership in the American Civil Rights Movement, Dr. King called people to advocate for justice through nonviolent action. But Dr. King himself did not begin his career with the principles of nonviolence. It was something that he learned. In his first book, Stride for Freedom, Dr. King writes about his pilgrimage to nonviolence. Stanford University scholars document that King wrote that true pacifism or nonviolent resistance is a courageous confrontation of evil by the power of love. Both morally and practically committed to nonviolence, King believed that the Christian doctrine of love, operating through the Gandhian method of nonviolence resistance, was one of the most potent weapons available to oppressed people in their struggle for freedom. Dr. King wrote about six key principles that nonviolence needed to be engaged with in order for it, work, for it to work to change people. First, it was a person's belief or the decision that someone can resist evil without resorting to violence. Such a principle was not something that was common in the aftermath of World War II. The prevailing American culture was more attuned to the fact that it was your honor and your duty to fight for what you believed in. The second principle was that the nonviolence seeks to win the friendship and the understanding of the opponent. It does not seek to humiliate anyone. Nonviolence is not to be used in a spirit of shaming someone for their actions. Third, the nonviolence needs to make clear that it is the evil itself, not the person committing the evil acts, that needs to be opposed. The old adage of hate the sin, love the sinner captures this third component of nonviolent protest very well. The fourth principle that Dr. King had to embrace was a willingness to suffer without retaliation. It takes a lot of mental work to prepare yourself for the suffering that you know is coming, and even more mental work to be able to willingly, to gladly go through that suffering in order to make something good from the sins of others. The Catholic practice of redemptive suffering is the principle that is active here. Suffering can be transformative to a person who gladly bears it for the sake of others. It is a demonstrable and visible action of unconditional love. Now this leads us directly into the fifth principle of nonviolence. To practice nonviolence, you must remove any internal violence of your spirit. To quote Martin Luther King, the nonviolent resistor not only refuses to shoot his opponent, he also refuses to hate him. The underlying principle of nonviolent resistance, the thing that makes it all work, is the presence of agape, self sacrificial love. That is the kind of love that a mother has to sacrifice herself for her child, the kind of love that seeks goodwill and happiness and peace for all people and not just for yourself. The final principle of nonviolent resistance is to have a deep faith in the future. It is an unwavering conviction that God is slowly bending the universe to the side of justice and peace for all. My friends, in conclusion, we too, like Jesus, come from a world where there is injustice. We too have seen protests and uprising, violence and death. 
It is a world where we, like Jesus did, we have a choice in how we are to respond. We can choose to perpetuate the cycle of violence and hate and retaliation, or we can take to heart the fundamental principles of Jesus Christ. We can learn to use agape love in nonviolent protest like Dr. King did. We can learn to love our enemies, to love them into changing into being their better selves, and not hate them and renew the evil that they are exhibiting. If we, as disciples of Christ, truly wish to become like Christ, our love must be put into action toward the neighbors that we disagree with. In order to begin to rebuild and start healing, we have to reestablish our bonds of trust and care for each other. My friends, our work today and for the rest of 2021 is to learn to love others like Jesus loved, to love others while we love ourselves. So be it. Oh, 
our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee last our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee shadowed beneath thy hand may we forever stand true to our God true to our native land will you please pray with me dear God as the world is exploding in anger help us to bring peace as the world is groaning with illness, help us to bring healing. As the world is weeping with inequality, help us to bring justice. As the world is crushed with despair, help us to bring your hope. Dear God, we thank you today for Jesus, who came to show us how to live in love for each other instead of in hate. Help us to believe more in you. Lead us and teach us and guide us. Help us to know you more deeply and fully and to show your self-sacrificial love to our world. Dear God, as we begin this new year, we celebrate a new birth. David Zane Gibson, the foster by our foster daughter Chantel's newborn son we pray for all of those who are grieving we pray for the Gave family Val's big brother Thomas Raymond Kerr of Sheridan died on December 11th from COVID we pray for his wife over 50 years Carolyn and for their children and grandchildren we pray for the family of Sue Reglin, who died recently from COVID. We pray especially for her daughter, Shelley. We pray for Ray Roberts, whose lifelong friend, Jean Duell, died from a stroke on Christmas morning in Onstead, Michigan. We pray for the Douglas family, who are still grieving the loss of Robert B. Douglas. We pray for the Ron Roberts family who are grieving their Aunt Rita who was taken by COVID. And for Deb McIntyre's friends, Debbie's mother who died from COVID in the nursing home. We give you thanks that Carol, Carolyn Kerr of Sheridan, the grieving widow for Thomas Raymond had caught COVID but she is doing better even after a mini stroke. We pray for her comfort and peace, even during her grief. Dear God, we pray for the new strains of COVID that they would not be so contagious and infect others. We pray for all of the healthcare workers who are dealing with escalated numbers in ICUs and hospitals. We pray for all of those who are seeking other med medical care in this terrible time. We pray for Fran Roberts' niece, Jan Barnhart, and for Susan Lockers, Angie Ferguson, Michelle Mucha, Sue Raybeck's friend, Joanna, and for Chetnock's sister-in-law, Gloria, with her pancreatic cancer. We pray for Laura Weld's cousin, Mary Ruth, in Nova Scotia, and for Hal Ringler. We pray today for Jessie Tummin, the mother of Lane Mall of St. Petersburg, Florida, who is slowly recovering from multiple medical issues. We pray for Deb Adams' sister-in-law, Sam, who had emergency surgery for her colon. We give you thanks that Grandma Ann Marcelletti, LaBarge's grandma-in-law, is now returning to her apartment after breaking her pelvis and being in rehab. Dear God, be with her as she adjusts to living alone again. We pray for Fran Roberts' niece, Brooke, 
We pray for Jessie Howell, who is now back in her own apartment. We pray for Jeff Lowe, Margie Gentry's son, who is in Kentucky, and for Kathy, the sister-in-law of Nye and Pat Deckner. We pray for Pat Deckner's nephew, Mark Tweedy, who is dealing with a perforated ulcer. And we pray for Amber Delmont, who is in the hospital for severe kidney stones. We pray for Deb Adams' niece, Shelley, who was diagnosed with stage three kidney disease. We remember Kurt Westerhoff, and for all of those who are searching for housing, our family promised friends. Dear God, we pray today for everyone struggling with depression and anxiety. We pray for peoples whose marriages are broken and for relationships that need healing. We pray for strength and continued healing for those who are fighting fibromyalgia and glaucoma. We pray for those dealing with addictions and illnesses and loss. Dear God, most of all, we pray for your protection and your peace for our country. Lead us and guide us. Help us to learn to love and not hate each other. For we are your disciples in this time and place, and we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. gracious. The Lord be gracious, gracious unto to you. Amen. Amen. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Uh, music by Peter Schultes and arranged by Mark Hayes. 